Sammy Davis Jr. passed away earlier this year, journalists, performing artists, and others in the industry all searched for words to describe the magnitude of Sammy's greatness as an entertainer. Just about everyone has seen Sammy Davis Jr. perform, and most agree that he was simply incomparable. And yet few of us have ever heard Sammy Davis Jr. speak at length about serious issues. And so, like it is, has opted not to show you footage of Sammy Davis Jr. in performance. Instead, we'll show you a 1969 interview done in the midst of the tumultuous civil rights era, an era that made many, including Sammy, rethink a lot of things. We'll get started in a moment. I'm Lee Brown. When you call Crime Stoppers, you don't have to give your name, and you could receive up to a $1,000 cash reward if your information leads to the arrest and indictment of a violent criminal. Help win the war against crime. Call Crime Stoppers at 577-TIPS. That's 577-TIPS. At the time, Sammy had decided to stop straightening or gassing his hair. The fact that I don't gas my hair anymore, I wouldn't contribute that to any degree of new blackness that I have found. See, because I, I have found that also in the last two and a half years, that... I cannot judge a brother whether he has, you know, like whether he wears a tie or a dashiki, whether he has his hair straightened or not. Uh, I can't do that, man. I just can't. I did it for one reason. I just got tired of gassing my hair. I really did. I got tired of doing it, of messing with it. And I, and the greatest discovery for me, personally, was that I suddenly found myself being allowed to survive in a... Remember when I came along, man, everybody wanted to emulate Cab Calloway. Cab did this with your hair. You had to do that. I, when I worked the Apollo the first time, I could shake my hair. My hair fell down. And the, the brothers then, they got applause. Every act had lines like, uh, it may be greasy, but a comb so easy, you know. That. Uh, maybe red, but the roots ain't there. These are all lines that all the top acts of the period that I came along in used to say. Acts like something stumpy and uh, red and curly, smoke and poke, you know. Well, that need's not there anymore. I used to think if I didn't gas my hair, I had lost a part of my identity. And suddenly one day I woke up and said, if my identity you know, if I have to identify with straightening my hair, then I think I'm going to lose my identity because I'm going crazy with it. And that's it. I didn't realize that I think that the subtext of it was that I was trying to give up something to gain something. That came as a second realization, as an awareness of blackness. I didn't come, that wasn't the thing that motivated this. That's what I'm trying to tell you. I can't be dishonest and say to you, yeah, man, I felt it and that's why I stopped. No, that wasn't the reason why I started. At, l at later came, and then I realized that must have been subconsciously why I did it. Okay. Well, what in the social revolution that's uh, in progress right now for black people has really affected you? Who has affected you most, would you say? You mean what individual, what group? Yes. Was there any individual that really has gotten to you, uh, really uh, put some thoughts in your mind that were not there before? Yes. And... Strangely enough, man, like two men that I never met. And that, when I guess when they, one is dead and one is still alive, but he's not, he cannot come out because of the system. Uh, Malcolm, I devour every word he has ever written. I wish the awareness would have come earlier. I wish I could have had the pleasure once of just hearing him speak instead of on records. I wish I could have touched him. You know how you think you want to sometimes just reach out and touch somebody? Because that physical contact is very important. I wish I could have touched Malcolm. Uh, Elrich Cleaver. I think he's brilliant. And those two men have influenced me greatly. In terms of inner inner courage of saying what it is. It's very hard, man. Let me tell you something. When you got a date in terms of your profession and you belong to, in quotes, the establishment, if you 
you're going to make a turn in your in your life, if you're going to turn around and come home, you better not be doing it for no, I said something I can't say, you better not be doing it for no jive tip. Because you lose both if it's dishonest. The brothers can spot dishonesty two blocks away because they've had to do nothing but deal with dishonesty for hundreds of years. Now, going back to the other place, where you function, they ain't gonna like you for openness. So you better have your you better have your roots firmly planted. So that subsequently in the last two years, I get a lot of heat that you shouldn't do this and gee, that wasn't wise to do. That happened in the beginning. Now they just say, well, that's where he's at, and that's what we've got to accept. But is it possible or is it impossible to be become a star? and still have this grassroots quality. Do you have to sort of compromise and sort of cop out a little bit to get up there? There isn't a man on top in any field in the world that hasn't copped out, that hasn't compromised, that hasn't stepped on seven people to get there. I'm no different than anyone else. Maybe I had to step on a few more. Maybe I had to cop out a little more. But it was damn tough, man. I've been a star for 15 years, long before Many of the marvelous things that I see happening today within the black community was happening. It wasn't easy then. It really wasn't easy, man. But I had a lot of help. And I was hungry. And I wanted it more. I wanted to be a star more than I wanted to breathe. And I did a lot of things that I'm not particularly proud of then. But the point remains, Gil, if we as a people keep apologizing for where we were, instead of thinking about where we are now and where we want to go, I think we're going to slow down the process. I, this is my personal belief. Presenting a way to make life a lot simpler, the Clapper. Turn on a lamp. Turn on the music. Turn off the TV. Use it anywhere you need a helping hand. Simple. Plug it in and insert the plug from just about anything. Simple. Clap on. Clap off. Clap on. Clap off. The clapper. Give it a big hand. The clapper is available at Bradley's, McCrory stores, Walgreens, and Ames department stores. What's that great smell? Chicken. Oh, yeah. That's stovetop stuffing. Your mom is making stovetop instead of potatoes? The celery, the onions, and all that great stuff. Think I could stay? Sure. Mom, can I eat it to me? Yes, but we're having chicken and stovetop. What time? Eight. What time are you eating? Six, I think. Hello, Mom. You can never get enough stovetop stuffing instead of potatoes. And to make as little or as much as you want, try stovetop in the canister. How do you feel about your profession? Uh, I spoke recently with Carmen McRae, and she thinks that there's a system. In fact, she referred to you, Sam. Yeah, she yeah. said that uh, yeah. you've got more talent in your little finger than Dean Martin has from stem to stern, top to toe. Uh, a lot of people agree with that sentiment. But yet he makes more bread than you do. Is the system really playing preference? Oh, yes, man. You know it is. But you see, the difference is that this is the first time I've ever had a chance to talk to somebody who's there. Yeah, but, but that's it, see? This is what I'm talking about. You want to know how many times, you know, again, within the context of, of the world that I live in, which is show business, you want to know how many times your heart gets broken? I can't get a show. They, they won't give me a special. I can't buy one, and I watch cats pass me. I did. Unfortunately, all right. Some of the establishment is going to whip back uh, the Nat Cole show and say, "Well, we oh, I'm tired of hearing about that, man. I'm tired of hearing about the Nat King Cole, and we gave you a chance and you failed, and all that. I'm tired of that. Phyllis Diller had three chances, man. What about the Smothers Brothers?" They fail, they wait now. 
lined up to get them to do something else. I'm not denying their talent, but you can't deny the racism that's involved. Stop kidding ourselves. You know, I got on television in New York. I did it right here in the studio, incidentally. We rehearsed down the street. And there were some concerned people who wanted to see me on the air. And they happened to be white people, marvelous. But they got money. They got talent returned for money. There's no gift. They were giving a man who makes a million and a half dollars a marvelous opportunity to entertain the people in their homes better than the average cat can entertain them. Who? Ray. I don't, I don't deny the fact they gave me the opportunity. But they weren't dealing with a ham and egg. Yet. They weren't dealing with some kid untried and un, unproven. You dig what I'm saying? And that's what breaks your heart. Now, it's awfully hard not to be bitter about that. Because you know where you can go. You know what you can do. You know the exposure you can give to deserving people. You are bitter. You bet you're bitter. And I think I got a right to be. I'm sorry. As far as this business is concerned. Because I don't know nobody, Gil, that works harder than me. At this business. I ain't been doing the same act all my life. I try to change. I try to keep up the date. And somehow or other, the public has bought what I have to sell. Because they know. I had brothers in the days when there weren't as many. Thank you, baby. Thank you very much. When there weren't as many brothers coming to see me as come to see me now. When I could spot the tables and tell which of the people were there and where, the, where they were. Cats said, man, I don't like you and I don't like what you stand for, man. But you something else is an entertainer. These are my own people saying this to me. I've had, I've had crackers say it to me, man. I've had guys take planes, private planes and from Mississippi or someplace down there wherever it is, come to Florida to see me. Come back, my God, boy, I don't like you, but you show up and sing and dance. So I got that. And you got the, the various extremes. Only thing I want to do, when I had the NBC show, man, I was put stone in a trick bag with it. Partially by the thing, and partially by my own Avarice, greed, to want to succeed. I just wanted to succeed, man. You because know? when I walked into the NBC, there's one color cat there, and one man on the door. See, when I left, cat, well, one of the remarks that one of the fellas said was, looks like the Cotton Club. They didn't like it. And a lot of people didn't come, you know, in terms of guests. And I thought it would come and do for me. But we did some things on that show, man, that had never been done. And a lot of people got exposed that had never been exposed, and this is important. Sammy, what's the answer? What could be, or what can be done for entertainers that are coming up that will replace you someday, that are black, that may not ever be as great as you, but how can they... That's, that's a lie. There's some cat in the garage right now better than me. He just ain't been exposed. What can you say to him? What can he do that you didn't do so that things will be a little better and he may not have to be as bitter and disappointed as you indicated? I don't know what to say to him. I really don't. I would like to say to him, uh, keep your nose to the grindstone. Good will triumph. You'll get your just rewards. And you'll come up smiling, but that ain't the way the game's played. That is not the way the game's played. Yeah. I'm sorry. You can do it. Every once in a while, a thing like the special that The Temptations and, and the Supremes did will go on. And everybody that sits down there, wherever down there is in their plush offices, well, that's our contribution for this year. Instead of having... This show, for instance, on a coast-to-coast -coast basis. Because I'm sure that though you, your large audience are the, the black population of this city and the community, 
It's terribly informative for the white brothers or the white cousins or whatever the terminology is that you use. Uh, but they're going to know, too, where it's at. They're going to know where, what, what, what thinking motivates it. Because all they see is images. It's all, like, it's all black kids see. Uh, Sammy Davis Jr. on the, on the stage dancing, and saying, ah, here comes the judge, here comes the judge. Well, that's marvelous. Jesus, that's not the image I want my people to remember me as. I'd like for them to say, gee, he was a good entertainer. The greatest entertainer, there ain't no such animal as the greatest nothing. See, you can be good at your trade, try to learn it and be good as you can. I should also, they should also say, yeah, but man, he was not just an entertainer. He had a stake in something other than just entertaining. cats, a lot of black people, very upset about you marrying a white girl. Yeah. Say so that any man that is involved in self-identity should marry his own kind. A lot of black women are very, very upset when they see the cream of the crop, so, so to speak, marrying across the street. Yeah. What do you say to that? I say that's their bag, they gotta carry it. That's what I say. You love somebody, you marry who you wanna marry. The fact that my marriage is no longer in existence is, is sad. It's a reality that now exists. Uh, but when I got married nine years ago, man, I paid enough dues from black and white to last me the rest of my life. And I certainly didn't do it for a joke. I must have been aware of what the complications were, what the involvement was. And I knew a lot of my people didn't like it. But I have to live with me, Gil. My commitment, my awareness of what I am, my involvement to help in every way I can my people. Not, when I go to sleep, I sleep for Sammy. I love for Sammy. My children that I have are mine. And the brother on the corner, or the man that lives, the white man that lives in Cleveland, where all them cats that threatened me for two and a half years, my light were blowing up the theater, blah, 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 and threatened my children and threatened my wife. We paid dues, man. We paid dues. We paid dues to a point that I would say that is as much responsible for the separation as anything else because you cannot live in that kind of a pressure cooker. The kind of pressure cooker that we lived in. Yet and still out of it, I found surprising things happen with, in terms of my own people. I can't walk it again. We go up the smalls or go down the corner of Frank's, whatever it is. Go to somebody's house for dinner when I was in Golden Boy. Brothers would stop me on the street and say, Hey man, you know, I didn't like what you did, you know, but you sure got some kind of guts to do it. When the book came out, it helped a great deal in terms of understanding and what it was. I know a lot of people didn't like it. Then on the other hand, Gil, I, I can't be concerned about what people really like and don't like. So long as I know that my commitment, I'd rather have them. In other words, what would be a better disservice? What's the worst disservice? Do what you do that might disturb a few people. Or take a beautiful black girl, marry her, and use her for appearances. Would that be better to salve? How do I live with myself then? When that's not the woman you love. How do you live with yourself? And that's what I had to content myself with. Because I could have done that easily. Had them lined up. They wanted to do that. Make arrangement with you, baby. You do your thing, let me do mine. But boy, it'll be great if you can walk down. Almost went for it. That's no way to live. It's not, that's not even a way to die. Did you suffer reprisals? Did you feel it in your wallet when you married money? No. On the contrary. On the contrary, man. I had more chicks hitting on me after I got married than I ever had. I got more jobs than I ever had. <laughs> and everybody wants to see this cat. But you must remember, when I married my in 60, I wasn't exactly an unknown. 
you know, I'd had seven good years of success, good money. But at the point we got married, nobody knew what was going to happen, whether that was the end of my career or not. Let me tell you something what I feel, if I may just interject this. I don't see how a man like Stokely Carmichael's contribution to wherever the black movement is now can be shoved aside because he has a white lawyer, which I hear on the corner. I've heard it from brothers. Man, he got the man to do, he got the best man to get him out of it, the best man to represent him. Maybe the other cat was too busy, I don't know. But do we take his contribution and say, that's null and void because of it? Is that what we do? Is that what we do to our leadership? Is that where we are? Do we find ourselves being in that position? If so, then why do we create leaders to destroy them? Stokely's contribution to the overall movement is immeasurable. Immeasurable. Raps immeasurable do we take an incident and destroy all of that thrust that was used because they did it they stokely was the one that stood on in mississippi man because i was standing next to him and said the first time black power and had the program the ideas the thoughts the ideals the object the goals to back it up now and then went he may not have done it the way a lot of people liked, but he moved it forward. He, did, he upset a lot of people, but then so did Nero. And, you know, this is the thing that frustrates me. And I, and I, I'm saying this now on this show with you, which I could never say any place else. I'll be damned if I'm going to apologize for marrying my Brit one more time. And if anybody don't like it, that's it. They got that. I'm not going to apologize no more for marrying that woman. Does the same hold true for your religion? A lot of critics about your becoming a Jew. Do you react with the same anger? No, because four of the hardest core militants I know are black Jews. <laughs> Orthodox, it's so that's my answer to that. <laughs> I don't apologize. Let us not. I don't even get into a thing, man. We got too much to do. We got too much to hope to accomplish to get into a thing where we don't have to start explaining what every church we go to, what religion. We know better than the man we're fighting. Since black people control jazz, as I put the question to you before, is it impossible for blacks to control the press string? Uh, what do you mean? Control the booking control all the avenues, or at least have some say over to how this art form is presented. I control all of mine. Harry controls all of his. I'm talking specifically about jazz. Jazz I don't know anymore. Because jazz, as we knew it in the, in the golden days of jazz, doesn't exist anymore, really, in that form. Uh, I'm not talking about the, the artistic development of the music and where it's gone to. I'm not speaking of that or the talent involved. I'm talking about the bookings, the places that used to be don't exist anymore. There is no more, you know, the Royal, the Howard, in Washington, you know, the Apollo as well. When you could, when Diz could, we had his band together, the big band, with John Oposo and all the, all the, you know, and that, that, you know, Tad, everybody, Fat Girl, you know, everybody else doing that number, because I worked with all the bands in those days, and we, we did the little, the black, the black T.O.P.A. time, <laughs> with doing the Royal, Howard, Royal and Baltimore, Howard and Washington, the Apollo. Then they would do their, we'd do, go to Hartford. We would, so that they could work theaters, concerts, and basically jazz emporiums. There was Birdland, there was the Royal Roost. We don't have any place around me. And what happens is they eventually get back to having Dixieland, on, which is really almost in a carnival atmosphere. But that's the only way you can draw people in when you walk past that place. On. Well, wouldn't black entrepreneurship, though, uh, if properly handled, uh, resurrect jazz? I don't know. We're, we're long past, you know, 
we passed the third day. Uh, and I, I don't know if, it's, if it can be resurrected in the grand manner that we knew it. I see. It should be resurrected. It should be remolded. It should be organized. It should be black oriented. But the fields that I think we should be involved in, in terms of blackness, See, I'd like for a man like Harry Belafonte, who has total control of everything he does in concerts, and who knows concerts better than any man alive. He knows what halls, the acoustics, how many people. So he's the consummate businessman in that area. That I know about. In other areas, I know he functions well, but I, I'm not aware of how well he functions in them. Obviously, he does, because he's a success. I'd love to see Harry take and create a new type of jazz at the Philharmonic, presenting the now jazz, because he knows how to function at those levels. And like for Sydney, which I know this is part of his plan, Sydney is the biggest screen star in the world at this point, male. He happens to be the only black film star we have male, female, anything else, or in between. I'd like for Sidney to set up a program, which I know he has plans to do, to do experimental films with black talent, because this, this is his dream. I've got my foot in the door in films. I intend to do it. Because there is no sense in being on top of the mountain, man, if you don't intend to let that rope down and get somebody up there with you. Because it gets awful lonesome up there. Awful lonesome. What's the possibility, say, since you talk about lonesomeness, of a coalition? Have you ever approached Mr. Portier, Mr. Belafonte, about uh, a cooperative venture? Or I have approached Sidney and Harry many, many times, man. And for one reason or another, it has never come about. It's terribly frustrating. Because I, I say, unequivocally, I think if you put Sidney Portier, Harry Belafonte, and Sammy Davis Jr. in a film together, people would come and see it. It would be something that brothers, the young kids, young black kids could say, look at it, there's our three men together in something. Of course, it should have some substance. And with the with the coterie of, of black writers that we have today, we certainly could come up with something that is parallel about today's problems. Or how about the history of, you know, let's go back and do something very commercial, like how about a story about the Second World War with, with black soldiers, because kids have never seen that, you see. We've seen the Japanese go for broke. We've seen the, uh, the repatriated uh, Italian prisoners fighting. We've seen uh, the, the Nazi who was a double agent. We ain't seen the brothers do nothing. See, except one picture they made, which was incidentally one of Sydney's early pictures called the Red Ball Express, where everybody played you know, drivers. And Jeff Chandler was responsible for that being done. But uh, was a dear, dear, wonderful, great human being. But we could do that kind of a film. Blacks on production, technical fields. It's happening. It's it's a slow process. Because then when you're fighting the union, you're fighting the hardest. You're fighting the hardest part of the establishment, I think. But it's happening. It's not happening fast enough. Would, would black own production be able to deal more effectively with the union? Any time, of course. Any time. We did, we did a, a man called Adam a few years ago. Uh -huh. I got as many black technicians on it as I could. But there weren't that many available. Because what it is, is they got the start as apprentices. You get to work your way up. There is, what do they call it? Uh, not longevity. There's seniority. All them things you gotta fight. You dig? Yeah. For instance, and funnily enough, I was talking about this to my man, Willie Walker, who's in Chicago. I was talking to him about it coming up in the car. I said, there are some cats. When we were doing Golden Boy, this white man, 90 years old, <laughs> pulling the, <laughs> the curtain. He could never get the curtain all the way pulled. He happened to be a nice man. <laughs> And they'd get here, and then another guy would come over and go, oh. <laughs> right? But they couldn't get him off that job. <laughs> they couldn't replace him with a white man. Now, you know the brother ain't going to get that job. <laughs> you know? But that's the union. It's, it's, so that's
that has to be reconstructed. But it's nice to see that there are concerned people who are saying, let's change some of these structures. Let's change some of these things so that we can get the people in, get the mainstream in. You know, but it's not happening fast enough. Let's go back to the youth. The revolt on the campuses. Uh, you place a lot of faith in young people. Mm. What do you think is going to happen? Uh, our elders, the leaders of the elder generation, black generation, uh, have all been shot down or expatriated. Uh, Malcolm X, who you mentioned, Eldridge Cleaver, uh, Rap Brown, uh, Martin Luther King, and on and on and on. Where do we go from here? And what are the young going to do, as you see? Let me tell you what I, I not well as I see it, but as I would like to see it. I would like for young black leadership to take over. When I say leadership, you know, I mean leadership almost on a block-to-block -block basis. Jim Turner, Northwestern, staged take over the college with the black studies program and black curriculum and black dormitories. He had a 15 point program. He just locked off the building, got it. He didn't make a lot of headlines based upon the fact that it was done quietly, efficiently, and done. And nobody knew what was going to happen. This one, there was no warning about it. Took the building over, hey, here's the things. They looked at it within 38 hours. You got them all, unlock the building, give it back. It's done very quietly, precisely to the point. That's good black leadership, because it was well organized. We need, I see leadership around me that is strong and beautiful and just so soulful, it's marvelous. When you see little kids, black kids looking up at young, 18, 19 year old boys who represent leadership, positive leadership. Stand on a car going, hey, that'll make nothing. You really want to do something? You really want to do your thing as a black individual? Start in that block you live in. That's where it's got to be. That's where it's got to be. Be that leader on that block. We got to stop looking for the great Messiah. I don't want one leader no more. I want 1,700 leaders. Because then the man can't pick that one off and we'll all fall apart. I don't want a leader. One leader for my people. I want, I want to, I would love the day that I could go into a town and can't say, these are the cats that represent, and it would be almost a room full of the leadership in the ghetto or the leadership in the black community. That's where it's at because only that man knows the problems. Programs that they filter down from City Hall, down whether it's New York, Cleveland, whatever it is. There are certain things that the Panthers know about the black community in which they permeate that no other person knows. And that's why they're the leadership, and that's why the young people listen to them and follow them, and rightly so. Because you ain't gonna know nothing if you ain't out there on the street dealing with it. I don't know what's going on in my street that I was born and raised on 140th Street. Because I, as much as my heart cares and is there, I'm in Europe doing a picture. I'm over here doing something. So I'm not going to bull con and come back and say, hey, baby, I know what's going on. I don't know what's going on. That's why I listen to everybody I can listen to. I will listen to the Panthers. I will listen to the... To anybody, core, snick, anybody, because I want to hear what's going on, and then let me apply what help I can in my way. I'm not going to, I know I can't do what they can do, man, but maybe I can help somewhere along the line, in my way, to do it. That's all. And that's where it's got to be for me. Now, I don't know about anybody else, but that's where it is for me. When I talk to young people, whether they be on a college campus, high schools, whether it's in Chicago or Philadelphia dealing with kids that, that are what we call street gangs, or whether it's talking to the Blackstone Rangers in Chicago, which I'm very honored to say that they've made me a chief, which is really rude, man, because that, 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 that ain't never happened before. Uh, or whether it's talking to any of the people whose names I will not mention, who are terribly involved with 
within the black communities of various cities. I just listen because I want to know where I can help. And that's what we all got to do. And uh, it, 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 it seems, though, that the establishment uh, is pretty opposed to this uh, struggle. Uh, you're in close contact with a lot of people that are very prominent. Let's, let's take it from the top on down. Yeah. The president. Yes. How does he strike you? Did you vote for him? No. I didn't vote at all. Which is wrong. Why didn't you vote at all? First of all, I came back too late from Europe to register. Right. Um, Would you have if you had come back in time? I don't know, baby. To be honest with you, I really don't know. There's a great line that I heard a comic say. I would stand firmly behind the president if I knew which way he was facing. <laughs> I don't know where the man is. And I got, you know, I got a lot of questions just as an American. It's a great stake in this country. I, and I know I sound like a militant, and I am, in my way. I'm a militant. I ain't going to a place else to live, see? Because this is it. Because if it can happen to me, with all this, with one eye, broken nose, short, then it can happen to any black cat in the world that wants to pay the dues I pay. Junior attracted a large number of people, many of whom are themselves quite distinguished in the performing arts. Some chose not to stop and talk with the large press contingent gathered at the entrance, but a few did. I'm just one example of the people that, well, the name, you know my name because he's responsible for it. I've seen him all in my career. I've started with Joseph, who's considered he was very It's the greatest entertainer ever lived. I understand it's a real mm -hmm. Matthew Barton nun, rock and roll jazz. He, he covered every every phase of all fields. He is the greatest. And God bless his soul. But perhaps it was inside that Gregory Hines spoke most movingly about Sammy. So the family has asked me to, to speak today, and, uh, and so I'm going to try to do that. I have a very hard time with, uh, with uh, celebrating and, and feeling good right now. I know that that's what we should be doing, but for me it's, it's, uh, it's just not possible because I miss him so much already. And so I think it's going to take me a little time to, to feel that way. I know I will, but right now it's a, it's a tough reality. I idolized Sammy Davis Jr. And I want to talk to you about uh, a couple of occasions in my relationship with him. First time I saw Sammy Davis was, uh, I think it was 1956. And uh, so I'm at the Apollo Theater in Harlem. 1956, I was 10 years old, and I had been tap dancing at that point for about seven years. And I knew, I knew that I was a pretty good tap dancer, and I had seen a lot of really great tap dancers at the Apollo and on film. But there was just something about going to see Sammy Davis that uh, I remember felt very special. I know that I had seen him on television on one of those uh, Colgate Comedy Hour things, and, and uh, he sang and danced. And it just seemed like, it seemed like black people connected up with him in a way that, that uh, in my young life at that point, we didn't seem to connect with any other black artist. It seemed like he just had something. And so we were going to go see him at the Apollo. But I was so happy. The Apollo had four shows a day. There would be a show, and then there would be a movie. And the movie was King of the Kyber Rifles. <laughs> I 
I know that because I saw it three times that day. Remember that. So it was our custom if we were going to see a couple of shows. Usually the place was crowded and we'd get a seat wherever we could. And then when the, the, the live show would end and the movie would come on, people would leave. And then we would move down closer to the front. And he sang. And then he, he did impersonations. He, he, he did impersonations. And they were of light stars. And it was just amazing that, that he could do it and that he did it. Because 1956, black people were really struggling. And there were things as a young boy that I was told I shouldn't do and I couldn't do. And I had to be careful. And I had to... But Sammy Davis did whatever he wanted to do. And he did it so great that it was all right. He couldn't be denied on the stage. And then he played instruments. He played the bass. He played the trumpet. He played the drums. And it wasn't one of these situations where people could say, well, he's a jack of all trades, a master of none. No, he could really play those instruments to the point where trumpet players would want to see Sammy Davis. And bass players, he wasn't just playing the bass, just boom, boom. He would do 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 doom boom. He would just play. And he would get into it. And he was so relaxed on stage. He was completely relaxed. I mean, I had seen performers work. I knew, I had seen people work at the Apollo and seen two, three, four shows. And I knew that people had an act. And that's what they did. They just did it. And then it was great, and then that was it. But Sammy Davis, it seemed like, you know, in the middle of the act, he could just do different things. And, and, and I remember at one point, he, he, he began to tell a joke to the audience that he had heard. And he couldn't finish the joke, much like if we do it in you know, our living rooms. He was telling the joke, and he was laughing. And he couldn't say the punchline. And I just thought, I just couldn't believe that he was so relaxed on the stage. And then he tapped. And I knew good tap dancing. I knew what it was to do it. And I knew the really great tap dancers. And he was a really great tap dancer, too. He could do all those things, and he could tap also. I could only tap. There's a moment in my life that is so vivid to see Sammy Davis. And that was the beginning of my relationship with him. And I was in the front row and he was singing Hey There. And he was so loose and he saw me. I guess he had seen me for three shows just moving down. And he had, you know, he had one of those spots in the song where, you know, he said, you know, better forget her. And he looked at me and I looked at him. And, you know, I felt like he really acknowledged me from the stage. You know, I had been performing on stage, you know, I just, I saw the audience as just a big black hole. I never looked at anybody, and he, he was so relaxed, he actually looked at me and connected up with me and, and winked at me. I was so happy. So afterwards, afterwards we went backstage, and I just, I wanted to see him, and I wanted to touch him. I know I did. We went up to the floor where his dressing room was, and there were a lot of people up there. And he was, he was sitting in his dressing room, and he had no shirt on, and he had his pants, and he was sitting, leaning in a chair back, and the dressing room door was open, and there were so many people there, and so many people on the floor. And I, I looked at him, and he just looked through the door, and he saw me. And he reached out his hand, just like I'm doing now. And I just walked towards him. And he just held his hand up, and I reached out, and I touched his hand. And he just went like that, went like that. 
And it was a moment in my life that affected me in every aspect of how I felt and what I did and how I carried myself. And for about six years after that, I was Sammy Davis Jr. Put a lot of pressure on my parents to get me one of those Eton jacket suits. Slick my hair back. I was able to walk exactly like Sammy Davis walked. You know how Sammy Davis used to walk. Last time I saw Sammy Davis Jr. was about four weeks ago, and uh, went to the house, and he was sitting there, and he was watching TV, and he looked so good to me, always looked so good to me, and, and he couldn't talk because he had a thing in, and, and I went to him, and I spent some time there with him. And when I was leaving, I kissed him and told him I loved him, and he told me that he loved me. And I got up, and I walked a few steps, and I turned around, because I really felt like that was going to be the last time I was going to see him alive. And he looked up at me, and he reached out for an imaginary ball, and he picked that up, and he threw it like that. seriously and I'm going to carry that ball and then I'm going to give it to somebody else and I feel like from this day on I charge myself and I charge all of you here that we have the responsibility to let people know who Sammy Davis was we have to make the documentaries we have to write the books, we have to sing the songs, and we have to tell people who he was and what he did. And we have to transform Sammy Davis into the folk hero that people become who are like Sammy Davis in life and who go on. It's our responsibility. And, uh, and I know that we can do it. like for them to say, gee, he was a good entertainer. The greatest entertainer ain't no such animal as the greatest nothing. See, you can be good at your trade. Try to learn it and be good as you can. I should also, they should also say, yeah, but man, he was not just an entertainer. He had a stake in something other than just entertaining. For transcripts, send four dollars to like it as transcripts, Journal Graphics, 267 Broadway, New York, 10007. Or call 212-227-READ. Rush service is available. Gotta be me.